angle. Hi, everybody. My name is David Siegel. In March, when we were told to shelter in place, I knew I was going to be with my boys for quite a while. And so I decided to buy a foosball table and turn it into the world's first competition sized foosball table coffee table. Now there are other foosball table coffee tables and they are smaller and in fact they have three rods only. They only have like three rods. They don't have four and four people or kids couldn't play on those. They're, more, they're kind of toys. They're more coffee table than foosball table and I wanted a real competition size 52 inch three goalie <laughs> uh, foosball table and I wanted it to be a coffee table. So I put about 350 hours into this thing and over the last three months I built this coffee table, foosball table, and I want to take you through that journey of trial and error and experimentation and learning by doing so you can see how I built it. I don't expect anybody else in the world to build another table like this, but on the way you'll learn woodworking, metalworking, working with acrylic. Uh, I bought a drill press during this process. So I recommend this video for people who are intermediate hobbyists. I don't have a wood shop. I don't have a machine shop or a garage. I, I live in a one bedroom apartment in downtown Washington, DC. And a lot of people also are hobbyists who don't have a lot of space and they have a few tools. So I'm going to give you a guide to how to kind of get what you want when you imagine it so that it turns out the way you want it. I'm working on the foosball table for the kids. I cut off the legs. I painted the sides black and uh, I painted the playing field with three coats of clear just to make it a little harder. Now I'm getting ready to put the glass on. Now I've taken, I went to Home Depot and you can order as well and just get, just get a dowel, square dowels, one inch, one inch square for this. I painted them black. So I've got all my squares, all my pieces of doweling now. And this one you can see I have glued and clamped in place. Also want to be aware that these are not perfectly straight. And so if there's going to be a bow, you want the bow to be up and down, not side to side. A bow up and down is going to get smashed down by the glass. So you don't want a lot of material here. You just want to spread it out. It's going to clamp and smash down. I'm lining it up here so it's flush and then I'll clamp. The right number of clamps for this job is four, uh, and I only have two, so I'm just going to make it work. In fact, I'll probably move the clamps after an hour or so. So then here we'll put the second clamp on, and the only thing I'm really trying to line up is the outside rim here. I've got the one inch dowel here that I painted up with the same uh, paint and I've glued it and clamped it here on the side and then I've glued and and clamped the rubber now here is my painted dowel it's a uh, it's already glued for this demo and I've got I've got rubber hard rubber from Amazon eight dollars this is not neoprene this is not foam not weather stripping it's hard rubber and you're not going to cut hard rubber with a pair of scissors. That's, that's not going to work because at the very end, it's, not just, it's just not going to go straight. It's going to be a little, it's going to be a little uh, askew. So the only way to cut the hard rubber is, this is a very sharp knife, and to just go straight down. And I'll show, I'll show how we do that in a second. So, so here I've got rubber cement on both sides and to do it right uh, the right way to do rubber cement on a long surface like this is to use chopsticks now 
I don't have chopsticks, I have one chopstick. So I've got a few pencils and I will put a few pencils along here. This is, this has already got the, the uh, rubber cement and I will just lay this on here, move it around and start over here. That will let me line it up perfectly here and then work my way lining it up as I remove the pencils. And so I don't need an assistant, I don't need to get it perfect. I'm just gonna line it up here, I've got the glue on. I've got my blue tape that shows the ends. So the blue tape shows, keeps me centered. This gap here is specifically for the fingers when you want to put the glass down. Okay, I bought some felt with glue on the back and I'm going to put it here on where the gold deflector is so it's not so loud when the ball strikes the back of the gold. So I'll just peel it back and fold it here and try to get it aligned first before I... Everything has to go in through the front door here so it's a little crowded. And that's going to be just fine. Okay, I decided that I wasn't happy with these little silver areas because everything else looks so nice and black now that I have the, the black rubber on and you can see that the height at one and a quarter inches is correct for the glass because these clear these are going to clear the glass so I'm doing a quick little spray paint job to just blacken these up I'll put another coat and I'll do that four times And then I'm going to get into the rods. Now, the idea is to make the rods telescoping so that they don't protrude out, so they don't slide out to the other side because those rods are pretty long and you don't want them in the middle of your living room. You want to have telescoping rods, which are possible but hard. And you'd think that the difficulty with this, if the ball gets jammed, then you don't lose your player, right? Bang like that. And you don't lose your, your player doesn't come off because your epoxy is no good. And that's not the problem. It turns out that the real force on these guys is when you hit the end, it's lateral. So I have roughed up the surface here underneath and I'm just gonna show you that. So for every guy, I'm gonna mount these 90 degrees to the to the hole so I won't be using the holes. I'm going to cut some grooves this way in it, you see, for the next one. For all of the rest of them, I'm going to cut some grooves which gives even more chance for the epoxy to dig in there and have more grip. Now, I don't have a bench, I don't have a vise, I don't have a whole setup, so I'm just putting the drill against my knee and then I'll just move the rod back and forth because I've made some little hold. Today's gluing day. It's time to glue all these players onto all these rods. 22 players. We're only going to get one side today. Not too difficult, but I don't want to do too much of that. Okay, the, uh, the epoxy came out really well, and even though it, it's just hard as a rock, these things are never going to leave, 
And even though uh, it was kind of messy and it's, it's really hard stuff, it's actually not difficult to clean up, especially on this soft plastic. So I was able to go along afterwards and just clean up the perimeters a little bit. Okay, I need to use this again to ream out a few tubes because they weren't as clean inside as I need for the new stainless rods. And now I'm going to show you what a dull bit looks like. You, you go through a lot of small bits and so you need to have plenty of them and this is a good example completely useless bit so you're gonna just you just throw these away you're just gonna go through plenty of them and that's why you need a little bag of little bits so you can just grab another one and uh, just whenever you're at the hardware store or and on Amazon pick up and this is cobalt so I hope this will be nice and sure. When you're pulling a drill bit out of a hole, you want to keep drilling forward. You don't stop and you don't go backwards. Once you're down, you you keep up the speed as you pull the drill bit out of the hole. So this is the next size up and it's pretty hard material so I don't want to go too big, too fast. I mounted the ball grinder on top of my little shaft here and we're just going to make another pass through the tubes. Okay, I got my $25 gun cleaning kit. Never in my life thought I would own a gun cleaning kit, but I do now. I learned that using a rag is better. It's probably stuff that all the gun cleaner guys know, but, <laughs> but when it goes in, <laughs> uh, it goes in pretty well. And then if you pull it out, it bunches up and it doesn't want to come back. So I had to use, put it on the end of my tool here and then take it all the way through, and then it comes out just fine. So now I have wiped out the tubes, and before, before I did all this polishing inside, I'm using a soft nylon rope here. It easily grabs snags, and it was, it was snagging all the time. And now I can feel that it's nice and smooth. Here we go, here is our test of our of my uh, my rod system, my my telescoping rods, it's going to work. <laughs> After I don't know how many different rods I had to order from McMaster Car and send back, I have a system here that works. I can tell. And now I've got a kind of a rough cut, and I want to make it into more of a bullet shape so it goes easily as it slides into the rod, right? And I found a fun way to do that. So I've got this 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 is Velcroed. Uh, 60 grit sandpaper here on my you can replace it. oh yeah I have lots of these yeah but it's velcro goes on real quick and what I can do I've got this kind of worked out I can just use any angle I like No, 
this just goes just back and forth yeah. in tiny, see that? This is what a multi-tool does, it goes back and forth. But it'll go back and forth, you know, 60 times, 60,000 times a minute oh, or whatever. Yeah, and it actually is, it doesn't normally, you know, it's hard to get hurt with this tool, um, but it's super effective. So here I have a nice slippery, I'll just do a little more angle. Okay, I'm in polishing production mode now. I've taken each of the rods and I sanded them with 800 grit and then again with 2000 grit to get them ready for the final polish. I have to be careful that this doesn't fall into the rotating bits here or it'll get scratched. Now to just get the rouge off, there's a little bit of rouge on most of these, I'm using a damp cloth. It's the damp, you know, a dry cloth will just kind of burnish it in, but a damp cloth grabs the rouge and pulls it right off. And finally, after a lot of grinding, and my second tool got ground down, goes all the way on all eight. That, that should work really well. Uh, yeah, since this is the most crowded one, all right, let's see how this goes. Just learning every day, every day, how this is going to come together. And so, yeah, there's plenty of room here. I can just push this together, you know, and, and this is going to have more friction than I want. But here's, here's the system. Okay, so I improved the bullnose here, and this is kind of my final test. And I decided that it's not acceptable. So I'm going to replace these with stainless steel rods and counterbalanced men. Okay, the steel rods have arrived. And different from McMaster Carr, they pack this tube by stuffing a wad of foam inside. Uh, and that made it impossible <laughs> to get the tubes out. So I had to destroy the, <laughs> the carton uh, to get them in. Here they are. And now we have eight tubes. That... Okay, I promised a free cooking lesson in this video, and I want it. This is a, this is a proprietary formula of on how to cook plantains, and it comes in two steps. So you go to the store and you get the darkest, brownest plantains you can find. I think I have four of them here. And then you preheat the oven to 72 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius. And you put them in the oven. You're gonna let them cook at 72 degrees Fahrenheit for, just like that, for between between five and 10 days until they are black. When you hit the end, you want to have some shock absorption that doesn't, that prevents the table from vibrating too much. That's just going to cause wear and tear. And over time, things are going to fall apart. So this is designed, this is a standard bumper that's designed to fit on top of five eighths. That's, this is interesting. This is something I, I realized. This is a very tight fit and this, these are much looser. Okay, and loose is good because generally there isn't any lateral force on this. It's, it's always inside, you know. Uh, there's nothing pulling it out because there's, there's, no, there's very little friction here. But because this is very tight, what will happen over time is as this goes in and compresses, 
it stays compressed and then the bumper will pull it out and that will pull this rod away from where I've installed it. Okay, I have it mocked up here. I've made a, a little wooden sleeve for here, which will probably be a bit different, but this is the basic idea. Then comes the bumper and this, I opened it up, but it's still a bit tight. And I wanna show you that my theory was correct. Here's my, here's my larger sleeve and watch, watch. See, I was right. It works itself out because of the stickiness of this washer. And now I've opened this up so it's much, there's more room here. So there's more play. And now it doesn't happen. Now we don't have the pulling out effect. Okay, everything is set up and aligned. Now it's time to do the amazing JB weld. This has been kept at boiling water temperature for the last 20 minutes. And I'm gonna try something new. I'm gonna to try to mix in the bag and then dispense from the bag. So uh, let's see if I can do that. I don't know how much time I'll have because this, this is a very long set, but it does start to get stiffer after about 10 minutes. So I'm hoping that somehow I'll mix it, cut the bag and get going here. Now here's the tip. I am not, I'm trying to get it in these holes, so I'm not going to cut much. Let's go. Oh boy. I wasn't watching. Good news is I can scrape that off. That's a bit big, that hole. Okay, it's about five hours later and I've, I've cleaned these up a bit and it's easier to move, handle these things now. Uh, they're much less delicate. So now I wanna fill in here and just put dots here. And the same amount. Black, nice and nice and loose. That's good. Now we mix as before. I like the plastic bag mixing method a lot. And a very small snip. You can always make it bigger. All right, let's go. Oh, that looks just right. Oh boy. This, this is control. I'm just going to, it'll, it'll level as long as I get the right volume. That will, wow, this is impressive. Buff these guys. Doesn't take long. Okay, I got it. Finally. It's not easy. And then the trick is to just get rid of a lot of the stickiness. And this is a good way to do it. You can use your forehead if you need to, but. Uh, this is fine and then it'll unfurl inside like this just use a 
tool. Stick that down. There. It unfurls easily. It doesn't take that long once you get good at it. These aren't going to be needed because they're going to be telescoping to here. Then I thought it would be cool to just plug these and, uh, and then sand it all flat and then repaint it black so that there's only four handles and the delivery hole and that's, and that's it. Then these receptor holes are gone. And that's even more custom uh, and it's a bunch of work. And I need to one inch plugs and I don't really want a set of hole saws because I just don't need them. I really never use hole saws. I guess I could get a set, but instead I just bought the holes <laughs> on Amazon. I just got some oak one inch holes. So I'm going to put in a little wood glue into the holes here. And it's a very tight fit. So I'll be just smearing that in. Maybe a, a bit more. And then I'll tap it in with the hammer and get the fit right. I'm getting the, the, the grain. No, I don't even need to tap that in. Okay, I think, okay, I think it's day 12 now. And this one is looking perfect. This one has cooked really well for 12 days and it's looking nice and black. So we'll put it in the oven. Well, it's been in the oven. Now we'll turn up the heat. Step two, turn up the heat to about 300, 320. It doesn't matter much because it's actually, the plantain is already cooked. It's been cooking for 12 days. That's the cooking part. Now all you're really doing is heating it up and we'll heat it and we'll cook it a little bit to caramelize the sugars and it'll, it'll explode out of the, out of the peel. All right, now you'll notice I'm gonna paint this whole area here after I plug a few of these holes and I am masking in short segments. I'm not trying to run a piece of masking tape all the way across. This doesn't use much more tape and it gives me the ability to hold a nice snappy line where I want it without trying to worry about continuity the whole way as I go. So this is what I want to make. I want to make eight of these. This is half inch. I recommend everybody go to eBay and get these strap wrenches. The one thing to notice about there, it's like eight bucks for two of them, is that this, this rubber, you know, it, it'll open up, it'll, it'll, uh, this comes through the handle this way. It's not open on the side. And this is just going to hold the tube really well. It grips fantastically. And uh, I can just start cutting away. And very soon, because I have a new uh, blade on here, uh, this is just going to be cut with a nice clean edge. I've got about six more to do, I think. And they're all going to look like this, ready to put in and put glue around. OK, I have a plan. I'm, I need to make this, I need to put the collars in that hold these interior rods. And they have to be really solid. And then I'm going to make it flush and then paint this whole area, all this side black. But it has to be really rock solid. And then I've taken these one inch plugs and they were they were tapered on the edge, which was too tight. So I've, I've sanded them down and these are going to go in here just like that. And I'll pound them in. Oh, see, that was easy. Then I'm just going to see that's going to fit flush. Okay. It's late at night and I want to get this, these pieces in place. And I want to start with the story of the Apple factory in China at the factory that makes the iPhones. They can make the glass, the Gorilla Glass, within 
uh, within a half a millimeter or so in each direction. Uh, but they can't control it any finer than that. And they can make the chassis within about half a millimeter or so, uh, but they can't control it any finer than that. So you imagine if they just start putting the glass on the chassis, they're going to get random gaps between one millimeter, and which is not acceptable, and too, too tight, which wouldn't go together, which would also be have to be reworked. And so... It's the only factory in the world that does this. They solve the problem because one millimeter gap or even an average half millimeter gap is too big for Apple. They solve the problem by making a database of all the glass and all the chassis and that's in two dimensions. So the uncertainties are squared and they, they measure very, they can measure very accurately. They pair up the screens and the, and the chassis and then find them and put them together for a close, very small tolerance fit. And all the Apple phones have that. No other phone company in the world does that. So that's what I'm going to do here because I can't control this exactly. And I don't know exactly how this is gonna come out by pounding the peg into the hole. I have made a, a bucket of these things and I'm just pairing them up. And I've got them pretty well flat flush here. I've got four to do, and these are pretty flush. They're good enough for me, and then I'll you try the other ones on the other side later. Just get a very small snip here. It's the important thing. Okay, I have everything taped off now, and I have plugged these four holes and sanded. I've done a quick sand of the whole surface, so I'm ready for the first coat. You want light coats. Out. Look how nice this came out. It's nice and even and it looks great. There's there's only holes where the where the handles are going to come out and there's it's blanked off where the where the rods would have come out but they're not going to. Okay now I, I made two passes last night and the second one I, I made a drip. You see this drip here? And I want to explain why, because it's pretty common. I, I avoided it on the other side, but here I sat down to make this pass. And what happened was the, the easiest way to make a drip is to do this kind of stuff when you, when you paint. And good, you know, to go back and forth and stop and go back. And you'll, you'll get a drip there when you stop. So, so the right way to do it is to go all the way across and then out of the frame and then back and then out and back and not double back. But here, what happened, see that, was that my hand, I sat in the chair and my hand got closer and then farther away. And the close, the, the, the distance, the shorter distance made the drip because I got too close with the spray can. You always need the right distance. And so it's better, you know, to stand up and to move with the can and keep it linear and keep it the same distance and work it this way. And I did that on the other side, but here I sat down. Everything is ready. The holes have been sanded. I've got tape here to mask off the internal fittings. And I've got four on each side. And these sides have been 
well sanded, everything is flush. And then I've got some protection because I'm painting inside. Okay, we can see the beginning of leakage here and that means it'll be ready in a couple minutes. The black took about six coats, six light coats to get everything black here and now because of the ball action and because of the, the impact on the ends, I'm gonna, I've really let this dry now, it's been almost, it's been eight hours. So now I'm gonna come back with two coats of clear to really seal it up and make sure that the ball doesn't get all black. pretty much popped. It didn't make a noise but it has split open and now it's ready to peel and serve. So this just goes down in. It's a little tight. And then Down. Now it's easy. Now this should be aligned. There we go. And yeah. And there's no rattle. There's it's not loose because I've added the the tape here. So sweet. This is woohoo! This is commercial grade, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, this is just incredibly hot. So we make a ventral slice, like that. And then we pull it up out of the skin and it usually just flops out. There we go. That is a plantain that is ready to eat after about 12 days just sitting around and then about 40 minutes in the oven. And kids of all ages just eat this right up. It disappears in seconds. It's time to cut these handles down and I have a 20 year old knife that I keep pretty sharp and this is a really good tool for cutting these down. So let me give you a close up. So I've done three here and I'm going to show you how this works with a very sharp knife that you may not have <clears throat> but I can't think of any other tool. And pretty much straight down is the technique. And it goes right through. Doesn't take long. <laughs> they disappear quick. Right? I'm stuffing it right, up guys? My nose. It's like candy, right? Uh-uh. <laughs> They're usually gone in a few minutes. 
I made this with chocolate once. That took about four minutes from start to finish. Now, I don't work in a shop or in a garage. I work in my living room in place. And that means you have to clean up. And this will show you that I have to go square by square on this floor and clean up the paint. This is overspray. This is paint that was in the air and, and then settled after I sprayed the sides of the table. Okay, I want to show you, I cut this one inch strip out of the Teflon tape and uh, I did this on the other side and it came out really nice. So I want to curl it all up, stick it in here. And this is for the ball launch. I don't know what you call it, ball launcher. And uh, just want to make sure this goes in flush. Okay, it's about five days later and this one is ready. It is popped. What need to do now is slip it out of its jacket and cut it up. And it won't last long. This is how you cook a plantain. Let it get nice and black for about two weeks and then cook it in the oven until it pops. It, when you're installing something and you're, it's sort of final, then you use more water than soap. You don't want it to be too soapy. Soap helps it glide, but then it's all going to dry off. There we go. I don't, it's not designed to take lateral force. It's only designed for up and down, for vertical pressure, so. Just go slowly. Walk it over. Okay. Get fingerprints on the other side. There are a number of glass companies online that will send you a glass tabletop. Some of them use pre-cut, predetermined sizes and you save money because they're sending you from inventory. I needed a custom size. They're the, the
the pre-cut sizes weren't going to work for me. So I got this from OneDayGlass.com and the size is perfect. It's, it's exactly what I ordered, but you see these, these corners, these are huge, like uh, bigger than eighth of an inch bevels. And this corner is close to a razor corner. It's very sharp. And this is a foosball table for kids. So I need to break this corner. So I have my DMT stone here and I've got the coarse. This is the Duo Sharp from DMT. Almost no pressure, almost no pressure. Just let the diamonds do their work. Take your time. You can't crack this because you're just not exerting enough force. Okay, I've done the medium pass, the, the coarse and the medium pass here. So I've shaped the corners the way I want them. And it's cool, you can, you can really see a lot by shining the light on. You can see that you, you, know, you want to get it pretty symmetrical, right? Up and down and side to side. Okay, I want to take the next step on the glass and then we'll go back to the other areas that I'm, I'm doing now as I wait for the new uh, rods to arrive. And so the glass has been cut with a, uh, a 1200 grit on the last pass and now I have a 3000 grit. I'm going to use that here just to knock down those peaks. And it's really helpful when you're going toward a polish or finishing something that you think in terms of doubling. So roughly, so you have a 240 grit then maybe a 500 grit, then maybe a 1,000, 1,200 grit, or a 600, and then double up to 1,200, and from 1,200 to 3,000, and then if you want from 3,000, you go to six or 8,000. You don't want to skip a level uh, where you're not going to get, a, you're not gonna get the, the balance between shaping and polishing that you want. Um, so this is very light. Letting the sandpaper do the work, make sure to go up and down as well. I want to add that 3 8 inch glass is perfect for this application because I've got it supported all the way along. Tons of support, so it's just a great, it's, it's actually a really good coffee table to use. Okay, I have these beautiful dies here. This is about $10 for five, these are these are real casino dice, professional dice. They use them in the casinos. These are unbranded. I didn't want to have a casino name on them. And this is my idea for a scoring system. So I want you to think this through with me, okay? The idea is that, here's the idea, and then we, we can modify it if we want. I can, I'm just gonna show you what I have in mind. Okay, two is gonna be here like that. And there's other ways to do this, but this is how we'll start, okay. This is my idea, whoops, that, this is extra, I can use that for practice. That the scoring system will be about that long and that I'll make another uh, steel pipe. This is steel from the interior rods and I'll just make a little short stand so it'll stand up just above, this whole thing will just float above the glass, just, you know, that much. Not much, because if it's very high, then they can turn, they can pivot, because if they're skewered on here, then, they'll, then yeah. they'll always look, you know, all jumbled up and wrong. So I want to keep them flat, so it's mm -hmm. going to be just off the surface of the glass, okay. all right? And it's going to be about that long to go from side to side, right, to to like, you know, when you have a, yeah like that, okay? The question is the design of it. And here's an example of the design. We could do one, 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 one. Uh, no, I was gonna show. Okay, I'm gonna make a first pass and do the same thing to all the dice. And what I really like about the system is that this is smaller than the, than the spot, so I can really get feedback right away whether I'm centered or not. This 
because if I'm not, I can fix it right now. Oh, that's good. I don't know if I need lubricant or not. Okay, I'm pretty happy with my little system. These have come out real nice. I've done nine of them already. And that was with the end mill. So those are done. Now I am onto this bit, which I previously modified the tip of. And this is a pretty good hole. I'm pretty happy with this. It doesn't need any, doesn't need any fluid. Just, just go slowly so it doesn't build up any heat. And so now I'm in production mode on the second set of holes. So this chuck system, this chuck system works really well. It helps keep everything repeatable as I go through the stages. Okay. Just easy to get right back into the same basic position. Lock it up. You can check that the first cut is symmetrical. <laughs> And go. So it's all about repeatability. Okay, I'm just going to take this down a little bit so it doesn't grab. Okay, I've increased the speed. I've just modified the drill bit. That's promising. That's pretty promising. Yeah. It's much, it's much smoother here. And you see my, see how centered it is? Can you see that? Perfectly centered hole. First thing we're going to do is check. Check that I've calculated correctly that 17 30 seconds. I've got a 30 second in there and it's just perfect. It's awesome. Um, God, I'm really happy with that. One more detail here. I'm using the four dot side rather than the two dot side because it helps me get better visual alignment. Because I'm going to line this by moving the board, not by moving the vise. I've done it. I've got 10 very good solid pieces here. I learned though that you really need to take the angle back on the bit. That's number one. And number two, that you have to take the edge off a little bit to turn it into a scraper, not a cutter. So polishing these is pretty simple because they just don't. They 
They don't need to be perfect, they just need to be a little less rough. So I want to talk about sanding versus polishing. Anything under about 1200 grit is going to be sanding where you're reshaping or retexturing re the material. But from 2000 and above, you're not reshaping, you're polishing. And I took just quickly grabbed some 3000 grit paper and I did this for about two minutes on this piece of this tubing that I got that's stainless. And here you can see, here's the mill finish that I got from the, from the factory. And then here's the polished, and this is 2000 grit sandpaper. And you know, it's not, it's not a mirror finish, but it's a nice bright satin finish. So I've got my glasses on, because it's gonna go this way. This is going in now. Now we'll see if it's the right length or not. Okay. Let's have a look. This can all be cleaned up. I'm certainly within one degree, but I might be. That's good enough. Now I will, that's a pretty clean joint. Yeah, yeah, I'm right on the same line. You have to watch for drift. It's a sharp cutting wheel, but I've I had one where it drifted a little bit and didn't stay on, so I'm always watching to make sure I'm on the same line. I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get this to be the right length <laughs> and a lot of effort that I haven't shown you, but the idea is that it's just a bit longer than the die, so the die doesn't wiggle very much. And so I've got, I have the right length. You can see it's about, oh, a millimeter and a half or so longer, not much. I'm pretty happy with the overall fit, uh, but now I want to work on the finish. And this is the 600 grit. Now this is a medium, this is I think a 440 grit diamond stone. And then this is, I think, 660 grit. This is called fine. It's actually taken a lot of work on the grinder because this is so hard. Stainless steel is so hard, but these are now pretty close to the same height and they're both 90 degrees to the floor. Otherwise there, there was an angle and I've, I've, managed to, I've managed to make sure that they're both straight up and down. Here's the setup. Uh, everything is on and aligned. I learned last time that I was able to make changes after a couple of hours. So I'm gonna get it filled up 
And then, uh, see, here's the first one, came out fine. And uh, this time, same thing. I'm just going to get it filled and then check it in a couple of hours and make any final adjustments because it cures very slowly. So I will make the smallest of holes here. Very small hole. And about right because there's there's a lot of void down there that I see that it's going to fill up so I've had this set of exacto knives for 15 years maybe it's really pretty easy to just keep these sharp with a sharpening stone so I just resharpen when I need to and it helps to have the right exacto blade for the job so it's nice to have a little kit this is diamond, only ever use diamond on glass. It's working out pretty well. Okay, I've enlarged the circle so that this piece just fits right in there. So I've got a bit of an interior void and I've got to make sure my ones are up because this is never going to go back down. My twos are all on the same side here. Okay. This JB Weld is harder the darker it is. If it's lighter, that means it has less epoxy and more catalyst and it's a little more pliable and then the darker it is it'll take longer to cure but the more it sets up hard like a rock so you can dial in the hardness of this material very small and let's go i'm just guessing And too much is bad. So that looks good to me. Oh, I'm going to clamp this for about an hour or so okay by messing around with the alignment while these things were wet i got this stuff all over and now i have to spend a little time on it like that this actually is in pretty good shape. I'm not willing to test it too hard, uh, but it's down and it's relatively firm. So now I want to make a red dot and I have made my own hole out of Plex. This is all plexiglass, so it's masked off and I'm just going to go in even coats that are very light. That's enough for now, that's good. Now it's hard to see with the naked eye, but I'm zoomed up here and you can see after four passes, I'm still missing a little bit on the right margin. I've got about five coats of orange there, so I'm sure that's good. Now I wanna put a clear coat on it so you don't mess up the orange when you touch it with your finger. 
Now, the thing to do is don't touch it until tomorrow. Walk away. It's nice when you envision something and then you actually execute it and you're happy with it. This has set up pretty solid. I'm sure if I tried, I could knock it off, but the epoxy has held really well. The joints are beautiful. Uh, it's all polished up. This dot came out perfect. And a legal game or normal, according to the rules, a game of foosball competition is to five. So here you would go one, two, three, four, and that's the winner. Uh, and it came out flat. You see there isn't much play allowed with the glass. And it looks fantastic. So I'm really happy with how that came out. I'm David Siegel. Today is May 28th, 2020. I have just completed the project I've been working on for three months. This is the world's first coffee table competition foosball table. It's a regulation 52 inch table. As you can see, there are four rods on each side, but the others don't come through. This is called telescoping. The rods telescope in and out, but they don't protrude out the other side. The hardest thing about that is these defensemen here because this is a very long pull and it has to be very rigid and it also has to be very slippery. And I've done that with a half inch rod inside and a 5 eighths outside and then with Teflon tape and WD-40 inside. These are tornado men that are balanced. You can leave them like this and they'll stay. The heads are weighted so that they don't swing back down. And the table is a, this is my stainless steel half inch rod that I just had extra from one of those interior rods. Game is to five, so this is the scoring system. One, two, three, four, five. One of the best features of this table is the way I support the glass. There's lots of room here for your hands to grab on either side so that it's easy to pick up the glass top, put back down, manage keeping the glass clean, and when your ball is stuck, you can use the nudger, get it in there, and kick the ball with the nudger. So the nudger stays under the table for people to use. Okay, I want to show how the whole living room has come together because the sofa is in. And what does the sofa do? It's a, it's an electric powered Very recliner. Sweet. And when you have a powered recliner, when you have any kind of recliner, there's a certain amount of space you need in front. Yeah. Okay, so now put it back, please. And you, you have to have a couple of feet between the sofa and the coffee table, and that turns out to be just right for kneeling and playing a game of foosball. So let's play a game of foosball and you can see how the spacing and how it all came together in the living room is right. Sometimes you have to use the nudger to get the ball. We also decided to go with yellow tornado tournament balls because yellow is better in low light than the, than the pink ones. Pink ones are better if you have lots of light. And we probably play now half an hour to an hour of foosball every day. Oh, good shot. You can see how helpful it is to have the short handles when we use it just as a table. How much did the whole project cost? Well, I didn't keep exact track, but I'll just give you a basic idea. It was 190 for the table with Amazon Prime. It was 320 for the glass. The, all the rods together was, that's the stainless steel and the plastic was about, about 200, maybe 230. Uh, and then, you know, the tape and feet and glue and paint, it's easily, it's 150 bucks. So whatever that comes out to be, somewhere around $900, I think. Now the closest thing you could get if you were doing this in another way would be to buy the Garlando 500 uh, competition foosball table with um, telescoping rods. That's going to set you back 1300 You still need the glass. You still need the bumpers, you know, the support system. You still need to cut it down. 
Uh, so that's going to be $2,000 when you get done with that one. In the last couple months since we've been using the, the foosball table, several of these guys have come loose. And they're not on the end like I expected. What's coming loose is here in the middle, these middle guys, several of which have come loose and I've had to redo them. And this is the fourth one, I think. So, so it happens when the ball gets stuck under here and you kind of force it, you kind of get it jammed and then, and then it pops the glue loose. I've redone several of these with the, with the JB epoxy, but now I'm gonna try a different approach and that's the filler and the CA glue. For starters, I'm scoring this better. I'm getting a little bit, I'm roughing up the surface. of the stainless steel rod. And it's not easy because it's super hard, so it doesn't easily drill. And then, this is the filler material. So I'll just make sure to clean all of any of this old epoxy out, and it's, it's pretty well gone. Then, and I want to line up the feet so they're in line with the rest. Okay. Now I'll put the filler in. Whoa. That was easy. I'm not going to fill it all the way. Whoa. I am going to fill it all the way. This is thin CA glue. Yeah, it's pretty hard. Let's do the other side. Okay. Well, a couple minutes later, this, this doesn't look beautiful. I could have managed the aesthetics a bit better, but boy, this is, uh, this is rock solid. So, CA glue and, glue and filler, which I think you can also use baking soda or some other household ingredient, works really well. And uh, that is probably the solution. So now we can play again. Here's the world famous tattoo artist, hard at work on one of his beautiful creations. This looks like his almost most ambitious tattoo project to date. What do you say, what's, what's the inspiration for this project, Shai? I'm stuck at home. Oh, okay, you wanna show me the other side of it so we get the whole sure. picture here? So here's, here's he's, he's left-handed, right? And here is the right arm. And this is a nice permanent marker. That's the way you, that's the way you do it. <laughs> that's the right tool for the job.